Okay, thank you, Alyssa. Um, welcome, everybody. It's uh, good to have you here on a Friday. Um, I hope it's uh, sunny and warm where, wherever you are. Um, I'm excited today to talk a little bit about uh, Education Superhighway's approach to fundraising and how we used a milestone-based approach to fundraising to accelerate our mission and, frankly, dramatically reduce the amount of time that we actually had to spend fundraising against our mission. I thought I would start with a little background on Education Superhighway and then talk about two of the key elements uh, of our fundraising strategy. The first being raising money against milestones, as the title uh, suggests. But I also want to talk a little bit about uh, our fundraising map and how we thought strategically about which funders to approach as part of our mission. So to start with a little background on Education Superhighway. Um, I founded Education Superhighway in 2012. Our mission has been to upgrade the internet access in every public school classroom in America. And we took on this mission because we believed that it learning, which could be a tremendous strategy for leveling the playing field of educational opportunity. In essence, our theory of change was that if we wire all the classrooms in America to high-speed broadband, that students and teachers would begin to take advantage of technology to enhance the learning process, whether by personalizing learning, by making learning more engaging, um, by giving students access to learning opportunities that they wouldn't have otherwise had because of their location, and effectively to, to make it so that it no longer mattered what zip code you were in, in terms of the opportunities that you had. To accomplish our mission, we essentially had to do three things. We had to bring a fiber optic connection to every school, because without a fiber optic connection, schools could not get the amount of bandwidth that they needed to be able to use technology in all of their classrooms. We had to put a Wi-Fi access point in every classroom so that students could and teachers could use technology from their classroom and no longer had to go to a computer lab. And finally, we had to dramatically lower the cost of broadband for school districts. Back in 2012, when we got started, the typical school district was paying seven times the typical business for their internet access. And at those prices, districts were never gonna be able to afford the bandwidth that they needed. I'm happy to report that after eight years of work, we have actually accomplished our mission. The classroom connectivity gap is now closed and 99.7% of school districts now have those three elements that are needed in order to bring technology to the classroom, in order to bring high-speed internet to the classroom. Essentially, we went from 23,000 or, or nearly 30% of the schools in America without fiber to just 500 schools without fiber. We went from 4 million kids Broadband upgrades are having the impact on teaching and learning that we hoped for. 94% uh, of schools report that digital learning is happening in at least half their classrooms every week. 96% of school leaders see it as having a positive impact on both instructor effectiveness and student outcomes. And perhaps most importantly, 85% of teachers want to use more digital learning in their classrooms, at least when they get back to their classrooms. The other thing that I'll note is because of this work and the tremendous amount of work that's been done by teachers and school districts and, and the ed tech community around the country over the last several years, we've really given our teachers and our kids a, a fighting chance to actually figure out how to teach everyone while they're at home. There are digital divide issues standing in the way. And of course, the spring was a, a big shock to the system. But I suspect that we'll start to see better and better uh, digital learning and remote learning going on as, as we start classes this fall. OK, so that's a little bit of the, the sort of history of uh, what our mission was and, 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 and where we've come from. I'm going to turn now to talk about our approach to fundraising. 
So our strategy for fundraising was really uh, predicated on four key elements. The first was setting a finite goal. Um, when we started, our mission was to upgrade the internet in every public school classroom in America. Well, there were only 100,000 schools in the country, and so we had a finite goal of upgrading those 100,000 schools. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about why that was important to our fundraising process. Second, we raised money in rounds tied to milestones. Um, most nonprofits that I've been, had experience with um, raise money on an annual basis based on the, the pipeline of, of funding opportunities that they have. We took a different approach, which was essentially to say, what are the next set of milestones that we want to accomplish? And, and what's it going to take from a funding point of view to achieve that? And I'll walk you through how we, how we did that. The third thing is we quickly understood which funders to focus on. This is the fundraising map that I was talking about. And finally, we developed a strategy to involve scale funders in our mission. And for that, I mean governments and large corporations that had a vested interest in our mission. What's important to know about these folks, though, is that the money from these organizations did not come to Education Superhighway. We used these organizations to actually drive the mission through either funding or how they engaged directly with school districts. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. All right, before I go into the specifics of these things, I want to make sure that everyone has the context of, of what we did from a fundraising point of view over the last eight years. We essentially did four rounds of fundraising, and, and I call them our seed round, our series A, our series B, and our series C. And, and partly that's the language of venture capital. And uh, before I started Education Superhighway, I, I had started a number of for profit startups. So this was Partly we did this because this was the only way that I knew how to raise money historically. Um, so four rounds of funding, uh, the first right when we got started, um, the second uh, a year later once we had a plan of, of how to attack the problem, the third uh, about uh, a year and three quarters after that, um, once we had uh, figured out sort of our initial strategies and piloted things and, and knew where we were heading and, and in particular to drive policy change. And then our, our last round of funding after we had achieved policy change in 2015. And I want to point out that um, the, the $50 million we raised in 2015 has meant that I have not had to do any fundraising uh, in the last five years. And that has been incredibly important because it's meant that both I and uh, the entire Education Superhighway team has been able to focus on getting the work done as opposed to focusing on how are we gonna pay for the work in the coming years. So that, that gives you the context and I'll come back to this slide uh, from time to time throughout the presentation. Okay, so finite goal. As I said, a key part of our fundraising strategy was that we had a finite goal and having a finite goal makes it easier to actually attract funding. Why? Well, first of all, funders I found prefer to invest in outcomes versus programs. They would much rather buy the fact that they would much rather invest in the idea that we're going to connect every school in the country than a program that says, well, we're going to provide technical expertise to help schools upgrade their program. Um, they want results, uh, not just process. Of course, process and programs are incredibly important. Second is, it makes it easier for funders to understand if you're a fit for their objectives. And, and I'll talk about this when I get to the fundraising map, but you know, when you have a specific goal that you're trying to achieve, it's very easy for them to understand what, whether it aligns with the goals that they're trying to achieve as a foundation or as, as a high net worth individual. And finally, it acknowledges that you're not gonna need funding forever. And you know we've all experienced the, the notion of funder fatigue, and this is almost the opposite of that. When they realize, oh my gosh, this is not something I'm gonna have to fund forever, it makes them more open, not just to funding you, but to funding you more aggressively and to giving you more uh, flexibility in the funding that you get. So establishing a finite goal was very important uh, to our fundraising strategy. And while many of you probably don't have finite goals today as your, uh, as your mission, I would argue that no matter what mission you're working on, there is a way to define a finite goal 
uh, that will get you a, a significant portion of the way towards making real impact against your mission. And that you can do that with a, you know, a 10 year outlook. And if at the end of that 10 years, when you've achieved that finite goal, you're still energized, your team's still energized and your funders are still energized, you can always pick another finite goal for the next 10 years to, to, to go after. And, and it really is a game changer, not just for fundraising, but also for the talent you can attract, the, um, the way you manage the organization, and, uh, and it really can be an accelerant uh, in, in pursuing your mission. Okay, so that was part one. Part two was that we used a milestone-based approach to fundraising. So what do I mean by that? Well, I believe there are four key differences in a milestone-based approach to fundraising versus an annual appro budget approach to fundraising. The first is, what are you focused on? So with milestones, you're focused on outcomes, as I was talking before. With annual budgets, you tend to be focused on programs, like what do we need to fund the programs that we want to execute this year? The second thing is, with a milestone-based approach to fundraising, you can use what I call clean slate budgeting. In other words, the way we would do it is we would say, okay, what are the things that we want to achieve in the next 18 to 36 months? And what is the budget that we need to actually achieve those things? As opposed to the typical nonprofit on, that, that's really focused on annual fundraising, you start with your pipeline. You start with how much money do we think we can raise and therefore what can we do based on that? It's a very different approach to things. The third thing is that instead of fundraising every year for your annual budget, when you use milestones and you and you think about them as sort of a two to three year period, you have a lot of opportunity to do multi-year fundraising, which is really powerful as, as we all know. And finally, the other difference is we did all of our fundraising in sprints. Three to six months before we were gonna achieve whatever set of milestones we were working on, we would begin the process of our next fundraising sprint uh, of planning for it. And generally it took us around three or four months to get the fundraising done. And then we were set for the next two to three years versus the more typical approach where frankly, you're constantly fundraising. So what are the benefits of this? Well, I really think there are four key things that uh, have happened for Education Superhighway as a, a result of taking this approach. The first is we've spent dramatically less time fundraising and it's cost us a lot less. I would say overall, I have spent less than 10% of my time over the last eight years fundraising. Um, and it's probably closer to 5%. And in addition, I did not have a development team. The only person that did fundraising at Education Superhighway was me. Now, contrast that with your typical nonprofit where the CEO or executive director probably spends 50 to 75% of their time fundraising and probably has a significant investment in a development team. Um, it's a big game changer. The second is it gives you strategic and operational flexibility. When you're fundraising against milestones, donors are paying for outcomes. And when they're paying for outcomes, they, they tend to give you a lot more flexibility and frankly, a lot more unrestricted funding to achieve those outcomes. As opposed to when you, when you fundraise against programs, they're expecting you to execute those programs, whether they're working or not. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. The third is it gives you the ability to make strategic hires earlier on. Um, when you have two to three year visibility uh, around your funding, and you know you're going to need that, say, a, a chief operating officer or a data scientist or, or, or some position that you really want to hire but may not have the ability to do in your annual budget. When you know you're locked in for a couple of years, you can plan those hires and you can make them earlier on. And it also gives you better stability for talent. When talent knows that you have several years of funding in place, it's much easier to attract people um, when they don't have to be worrying about, you know, is this job going to be stable? So I do think there are a lot of advantages to this. And um, so now what I wanna do is sort of walk you through how we did it. Okay, so as I said, we had four key uh, rounds of funding and, and these were really the key milestones that aligned with each of them. Our seed funding was all about 
uh, raising the money we needed to both identify the root causes of the, the K-12 digital divide and to develop a business plan or a strategy for how we were going to attack those. Our Series A, um, once we had our strategy in place, was really about uh, getting it going, getting it started. So um, we have had a huge uh, strategy around leveraging data to drive our mission, both in getting policymakers to act, understanding the scope and, the, and where we need to focus for, for our direct service programs, and also using data to scale our impact by enabling people to do upgrades on their own. Um, so we needed to collect that data so that we could do those things uh, with our Series A funding. We also wanted to pilot some initial direct service programs and to catalyze policy reform because one of the things that we had to do um, was there was a federal program called E-Rate run by the Federal Communications Commission that was providing $2.4 billion a year for, for K-12 and library broadband, but it really wasn't effective and it was not getting the job done. And so we wanted to catalyze the change of that. We used the Series A funding to achieve those things. And, 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 and with the start of that policy reform, we then were able to raise our next round, which was really all about scaling our data collection for use in policy change and starting to scale those initial programs. But really, it was all about achieving policy change. And then our final round uh, milestones was about actually accomplishing the upgrades. Uh, you know, once policy change was done, which, which was the catalyst for our Series C, um, we then were able to focus on say, okay, our next goal is to upgrade every school and to engage state government as our, as our catalyst and our distribution channel for doing that. So those were the four sets of milestones that tied to our, uh, our different fundraising rounds. All right. So, how do you develop a milestone-based budget? Um, there really are three steps. Step one is setting your outcome and programmatic goals. Step two is defining your program milestones. And step three is building a detailed budget to meet those program milestones. So let's walk through each of those. At Education Superhighway, and I'm gonna focus on our Series B financing, which was that $10 million financing that we did. Um, and, and really there were, this goes to a sort of our outcome and programmatic goals. So we had four problems that we knew we needed to solve. We had an information gap, we had an expertise gap in schools, we had a procurement gap where schools were paying too much money, and we had a policy gap with this E-rate program not having um, enough impact. So we had four outcome goals for our Series B financing. Number one, we wanted to build a national database of school internet infrastructure. Why? Because we knew that that would help us with the advocacy work we were doing. We knew that it would help us focus on where we needed to do direct service work. And it would help us create some of the, the tools that we knew we needed to drive the cost of broadband down. Second, we wanted to provide technical and procurement expertise to districts. We will, third, we wanted to create this price transparency tool and, and aggregate demand as a way of driving um, prices down. And finally, we want to spend a lot of time advocating for E-rate reform. And then you can see below, I'm not going to go through them all, but then we had the specific programs that we wanted to do to achieve those outcomes uh, using our Series B financing. So that was the first step. Just understand what are the key outcomes that we're trying to do and what are the programs that we want to use to implement. The next step is setting milestones for your programs. And this is a very detailed slide, but it shows you essentially what we did. So for each of those outcome goals, which you can see on the left side of this, the, this, the slide, we then set programmatic objectives and what we were going to achieve in each of those programs, basically quarter by quarter or half by half over the next two years. So this gave us a lot of clarity about the specific things we were trying to achieve um, in order to deliver on those outcome milestones um, that we were raising our Series B uh, fundraising for. And, and when I say all this, this is all philanthropy. This is not something where investors were getting a return on their, their money. So you can see the kind of detailed stuff that we went into. From there, we then built a budget. And this 
we were able, you know, most of, like most of you, most of our budget was really around people. And so based on the things that we needed to do, we were then able to say, okay, how many people do we need? What kind of people do we need to execute those programs and build up our, our budget? And then of course, there was some additional stuff uh, that, that we needed to fund as well. But this gives you a sense of the kind of details that we went through and how we, we sort of laid it out uh, going forward. Um, and this is one year. We actually did this for all two and a half years that, that we were projecting to need uh, for the Series B financing. All right. So those were the key steps. And it really, that part of it is probably not that different than what you all do every year when you make your sort of operational or strategic plans. But what it does do is it ties it all to those end goals so that you can really give funders the sense of like, here's what we're going to deliver. Here's here are the, the, the things, the milestones we're going to achieve. I think we're experiencing a little technical difficulty. So hold on just one moment. Hi, I think I, uh, I dropped. Yes. So if you, we missed you uh, the last bit of that last slide, Evan. I think that's about it. For a minute. Uh Okay, just a moment. Thank you everyone for holding tight. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, where did I lose you? Um, on the last slide, we lost you for probably 30 seconds to a minute. So just the end of the last slide on the budget, on the detailed budgeting process. Okay. Um, uh, so I guess what I was saying here is that um, if you think about what we did, it's really probably not all that different from what everybody does around developing your annual operating plan and the budgets are tied to that. But what we were able to do is we went out to fundraise is because we started with these milestones, these, these outcome goals, and then translated that into milestones and then translated that into budgets, we were able to make a very clear pitch to funders about here's what you're going to get, here's how we're going to get it for you, and here's what it's going to cost. So it really is a compelling um, approach uh, to, to, to inter interacting with your funders on fundraising. The other thing I wanted to talk about is the operational flexibility that milestone fundraising gives you. Now, part of that comes because when you're fundraising against milestones, you get uh, you tend to get more uh, general operating funds as opposed to funds that are dedicated for specific programs. And you can see that when we raised our Series B financing, there was a tremendous number of programs that we were planning to do and you know what we were focused on in, in each of the years for those programs. But what I'll tell you is because of this approach that we took to fundraising, um, we were actually able to start doing some of these things and then kill a lot of the programs. So as we quickly learned what was and wasn't working, we were able to basically say, okay, we're not going to put money against those objectives. We're going to put it against
when, uh, when you've gotten funding for a specific program, it's difficult to um, get that money moved to other programs. So, so that's the other thing that I just wanted to say in terms of advantages for, for milestone-based fundraising. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about is, is how we thought about our fundraising map. Um, so when we started, we asked ourselves the question, who cares about our mission? And um, you can see on the screen, there are a tremendous number of buckets, if you will, of, of organizations that we thought might care enough about our mission that they would be willing to provide funding. But what we quickly realized was that some of these were gonna be better than others uh, in terms of who we wanted to actually approach. And it turns out that making these decisions early on is important because as we all know, our, our scarcest resource is our time. And so figuring out quickly who's aligned with our mission and who might be good candidates for, for funding us it's, is really important because then you spend your money in those buckets as opposed to knocking on doors that really aren't likely to pan out. For us, we broke things into three buckets. First, the ones that have sort of the black stripes were federal and state government and broadband equipment companies and service providers. And those, uh, those were potentially big scale funders and, and we did have to figure out how, how to get them involved, but we decided we didn't wanna to try to raise money for either of them. We didn't wanna raise money from government because of all the restrictions that we knew it would come with it and how much we thought it would slow us down. And we didn't wanna raise money from broadband providers and equipment companies because we didn't wanna deal with um, issues about schools not understanding whose side we were, we were on. We wanted to be very clear to school districts that we were on their side, not trying to help the equipment companies sell more stuff to them. The second bucket was foundations focused on more effective government because of the policy change we were gonna do and ed tech companies. But it turned out that these were not really, when we talked to them, these were not really good fits for us um, for, a, for a variety of reasons. And so we learned that quickly and, and stopped focusing on them. And then finally, there are the people on the right side of the screen. Foundations focused on education, community foundations who care a lot about their schools, and high net worth individuals, and, and a special category of those, what I call the tech billionaires. And they were a category for us because they all had largely made their money because of the internet. They saw how the internet could change the world, and, and they largely believed that the internet could help change education. So this is how we, we focused, and this shows you sort of who came to play at different stages of our funding. And early on, it was high net worth individuals and family foundations because they were risk takers. They, they, we didn't have a, a, a clear plan. We didn't have evidence that we could actually, uh, you know, deliver on on the ultimate mission that we were, were trying to do. But they were willing to take risks. Once we started to get evidence about um, who it was about about our mission and that we could actually potentially deliver it, and started putting points on the board in terms of accomplishing things. Then we started to go to some of the, the larger funders, the, the education foundations, the tech billionaires, the community foundations. And so you gotta think about like who, who your target should be as you go along in terms of your mission. The other thing I'd say about this is you have to really think about the timing of your, your rounds, not only being about the milestones that you're uh, achieving and when you're gonna achieve them, but also around catalysts. And for us, we were able to really use catalysts uh, that were happening to drive the timing of our fundraising. So in the beginning, we had this meeting at the White House that um, launched our work. And that was sort of the catalyst for us saying, OK, let's go raise enough money to do a business plan. Um, when we actually launched our national school speed test to be able to sort of characterize and, and give data on how big this was, that was our Series A catalyst because we got some credibility from the Secretary of Education and the Chairman of the FCC. Our $10 million round came after President Obama announced a national initiative to actually solve this problem. That, it was great to walk into funders' offices and say, hey, the president just said we need to solve this. The government's on board. Now we, we're the guys to help do it, so we need funding to get that done. And then finally, our big round, our $50 million round, we had just achieved policy success. We had just delivered $2.5 billion of additional funding per year for K-12 broadband. So now it was time 
to go get things done. So it's really important to you know be ready to do these and to be bold when you do it. Um, I'll tell one story, which is when we when we did the fifty million dollar round, one of the funders that had had given us three million dollars in our Series B, I was meeting with them and sort of warming them up for the pitch and walking them through what had happened and how we'd gotten this policy change done. And they interrupted me and they said, oh, I feel like there's an ask coming. And I'm like, yes, there's an ask coming. And they said, well, that's great because when we gave you the $3 million, we actually had 5 million allocated. So I can give you 2 more million more dollars. And I said, well, that's terrific. And I really appreciate it. Um, but I'd like $20 million from you because I need to raise $50 million to get this done. And I want you to be 40% of that raise. And they sort of paused and stared at me and they said, okay, well, let's discuss that. And so, um, and they ultimately did give us the $20 million. So it's important to, as you're raising money to uh, make sure that when you have a catalyst, you take advantage of it. Um, okay, last things to say, um, leveraging scale funders to drive impact. I talked about federal and state government and the broadband companies and how we didn't want to raise money from them for a variety of reasons. But we knew that if we were going to achieve impact at scale, we needed both of those constituencies and stakeholders to be involved. The federal and state government to provide the funding to the schools to pay for the broadband and the construction of fiber and the, and the Wi-Fi access points, and the broadband companies to be willing to build out to places that they hadn't built infrastructure to before and to improve the affordability of broadband. So, so even though we didn't go try to raise money from them, we spent a lot of time with both of these constituencies to make sure that they would be on board with driving the impact in the way working basically directly with the schools as opposed to through us. Um, so that's really uh, how we did it and how we thought about who to approach. The last thing that I'll say is funders are, are, can be helpful in more ways than just with money. Um, they, uh, they helped us a lot with connections to key stakeholders, with governors. They provided us a lot of credibility uh, with governors and other government officials. They helped us with PR and awareness building um, and, and by attaching their names to the mission and the organization. And they helped us with advocacy. Um, and one of the things we did when we were doing our policy work was we got 50 of America's most prominent CEOs to send a letter to the FCC, the chairman of the FCC saying, hey, you need to re reform this program. You need to modernize this program. And at the time in 2013, that was a pretty novel thing that hadn't been done much. And, and our funders really helped get those CEOs onto that letter and it, and it made a huge impact. So that's all I've got. Um, I think we should open it up to questions and um, I will remind everyone that this is the second in a series of webinars. Uh, the first was how to use data to drive impact. That's available on demand on our website. And the next one will be um, how we leverage government partnerships to achieve scale next Friday. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Alyssa. Okay, thank you very much. To start off, Evan, um, we have a question about some no's that you received. As a fundraiser, we all get a lot of no's. Could you talk about how you, if it ever happened, got a no and then turned it into a yes? Yeah, well, fundraising is sales and sales is all about uh, overcoming uh, rejection. So yeah, we, we got plenty of no's along the way. Um, you know, some of the no's were from funders where, frankly, we just weren't a fit. Um, other no's were from funders where we were a fit, but we were too early or we hadn't demonstrated enough um, to, to, to actually get them to say yes early on. And, and what I'll say is that, especially with that second category, um, even if they're not funding you today, um, building the relationship with those folks, keeping them informed about your progress. Um, you know, we had something called our, our Friends of ESH letter and we would send it out every quarter and every funder I ever met with, whether they funded us or not, was on that letter. And, um, uh, you know, it kept them apprised of what we were doing. It kept us present in their minds. And so when we came to doing the next round, we were able to then go back to some of those relationships. And, and sure enough, there were funders who did not fund us in some of the earlier rounds that did fund us in our Series B or our Series C rounds. Okay. 
All right, thank you very much. I do have another question. Just a moment here. Were, when you talk about um, the funders who did say yes to this way of funding, this milestone approach, Evan, was it from larger or smaller foundations? Um, so basically, could you see this approach working for a certain subset? <clears throat> well, so the answer to that is both. So early on, it was smaller foundations and high net worth individuals that really um, uh, were our focus and were the ones who were, were willing to step up. The, the, the larger ones, frankly, wanted more proof. Uh, they wanted to see that we could actually deliver uh, on some of our milestones before they were willing to, to consider this. But as we got through our first two rounds of fundraising, we, we did start to switch to the, the larger uh, the larger funders, um, and you know whether it was the Gates Foundation or the Ford Foundation or um, you know uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, some of those folks, um, it was uh, the larger funders that we needed to get to the larger dollars, and and they did buy they did buy into this approach. Okay, um, thank you so much. Another question that came up from the audience was, if you had to go back and do this again, what might you change or what might you refine to this approach? That's a really good question. Um, I think that one of the things that we could have done better was leveraging community foundations more than we did. Um, we only had uh, a few specific community foundations that uh, were part of our, um, our final financing, our big $50 million financing. And I think that because education is so important in every community, that we could have probably engaged more of them. Um, and that would have meant that we both need, would have needed to do the work earlier to identify them, uh, to understand their priorities and which ones, uh, you know, believed in sort of the vision that we had of, of improving education through uh, digital learning. Um, and that frankly might have required us to actually have someone on staff who was a development person, because it would have meant that we would have had to go to a lot of, uh, a lot of different funders as, as opposed to the sort of smaller number that we, we did end up doing. Um, so I would say that probably would have been one of the things that we, we probably should have considered earlier on uh, because they were very, very good sources of capital for us in, in that final round. Thank you. Another question, if my organization is already in the process um, that you mentioned as by meaning that we have a team, we have a development team, um, and the CEO is doing 50% of the fundraising, how might you suggest we pivot toward a milestone-based approach? Yeah, so look, having more people to do this work is great. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but I think what you've got to do is you've got to start by deciding, can we set up our um, objectives as an organization based on a set of outcomes. And, and, and that's, that can be a change for an organization as opposed to saying like, well, what can we afford to do this year? And, and let's do that. Um, you know, it can be a real change to say, look, we're going to fundraise against delivering something because, you know, the reality is that if that's what you do, you got to deliver. Now, I think we all have confidence in our ability to deliver, um, but that's the commitment you're really making. And so what I would suggest is if you're already doing traditional fundraising, think about what are the things that if you could achieve in the next two years would be meaningful advances in your mission that funders would recognize as meaningful advances in your mission. And then basically say, okay, what's it going to take for us to get there? What's it going to take programmatically? What's it going to take staffing-wise? What's it going to take 
resourcing wise and go through that exercise. It's almost a strategic planning exercise, but really focus on defining success after those two years as the starting point, as opposed to sort of looking at what you're doing today and saying like, how do we grow what we're doing today? Think about it as what is success for us two years from now in terms of outcomes and then work back from that. Thank you. This next question um, is about what made this successful considering prior to Education Superhighway, and then you didn't have as much experience in the education and policy world, your experience was more in the business world. Um, do you think that part of this success was from your vision and the fact that you were coming from a non-education background, or was it your business acumen? Um, what kind of were those unique factors you think that made this so successful? Yeah, so from a fundraising point of view, um, look, part of it was I was used to doing this. When, when This is how every for-profit startup fundraises. They, they raise some money to, to achieve a certain set of goals, and then the understanding of the funders is that if they achieve those goals, that the organization is going to be coming back and asking for more money to achieve the next set of milestones. Um, so part of it was successful because this, this was the only way I really knew how to do fundraising. But what I would say is um, that really what made this successful was we gave funders the opportunity to pay for results, right? To, to, to make a bet that we would deliver results as opposed to that we would execute programs. Fundamentally, that is what is, is at the core of this and, and why I think it was attractive to funders and frankly, why I think it was attractive to the particular sets of funders that ultimately came on. You know, many of them, uh, you know, come out of the, the business world and are used to having to raise money in, in the same kind of way. And so it felt familiar to them. But I do honestly believe that um, selling results is a lot more effective than selling programs and process. Thank you. Just one more question. Considering the environment we're all in now with COVID-19 um, and all the challenges many nonprofits are faced with now, how might this change or are there any special factors to consider um, in the current environment, in your opinion? Yeah. So I'd say the biggest thing about the current environment is that um, it's difficult to get new funders. Um, you know, what I've observed as I've, through the, all the different nonprofit organizations that I'm involved with is that for the most part, um, unless you're doing something very specific in response to COVID, um, funders are, are generally sticking to the organizations that they know. Um, and so it's hard uh, to get new funders uh, involved in something. Now, that being said, um, I do think that the best way to get a new funder involved in something and get them excited about something is if you can paint a vision for them of, of uh, an outcome that you're gonna deliver that they want. And those outcomes are shifting uh, amongst funders and, and, and a lot of funders are, are thinking about are sort of rethinking not just their strategies, but their areas of focus. And so understanding what funders are doing today uh, or how they're reevaluating their priorities may give you an opportunity to find new ones. And again, I think that the, one, the, the folks they'll be most attracted to are the ones who you know, are pitching them on delivering outcomes as opposed to executing programs. Thank you. So you mentioned, Evan, that funders pay for results. How, if you fall short, uh, do those payments change at all um, or get retracted? That is a question uh, from our audience. Yeah, so I guess what I really should say is uh, funders 
really like the idea that they are paying for results, but the reality is they're making a bet that we're going to deliver the results. So none of our, our funding was actually contingent upon hitting any specific milestones. But what was contingent upon hitting uh, about hitting the milestones was whether we would get the next round of funding from those funders. So, so when we raised the $10 million and we said we're going to achieve policy change, for sure there was a risk that, um, that we wouldn't get the policy change done. And the process, we knew the process was going to happen, but there was no guarantee that we would win that debate in the way that we needed to to achieve our mission. So I think when, when, when I say funders want to pay for results, what I really mean is um, they're making a bet that you will achieve the results that you're telling them. And if you don't achieve those results, it's not putting that round of funding in, in, in jeopardy, but it is putting your next round, your ability to go back to those funders for the next round of funding in jeopardy. Alyssa, are you there? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I think I was on mute. Uh, <laughs> I said, thank you so much. Um, I don't think we have any more questions, but we can, oh, I do see another one just pop up. Um, one more, Evan, how definitive were your timelines and did you put a date on when you would see policy change? Um, so generally speaking, our timelines were 24 to 36 months. Um, you know, we so so our budgets were built around definitive timelines in, until we got to the last round when we had a five-year timeline. Um, generally, I'd say they were 24 months. Um, and yeah, we we said this is what we're going to achieve in 24 months. And um, sometimes we achieved it faster. Sometimes we didn't achieve all of our milestones, um, but the but there was always at least you know one of the big milestones that we were focused on that got done and became the catalyst for the next round. Thank you. If there are no more questions, we can. Oh, we did get another one. Um, if the organization's mission is a really large mission, how would you recommend focusing it in order to do this type of milestone-based fundraising? Yeah, I think it's a it's a great question. So let, let's take an example of our mission is to solve world hunger. Well, uh, one way to focus that would be to say, actually, our mission is going to be to solve hunger in San Francisco, right? That's going to be our first finite goal. And you know, as part of that, we're going to learn a lot of stuff, and we're going to develop strategies and stuff that could then be replicated elsewhere. Um, but our mission is to solve hunger in San Francisco. So limiting something geographically is one way of doing it. Another way of doing it um, is to say, okay, if our mission is to solve world hunger, what is the single most leveraged thing that we could get done in the next 10 years that would actually make the most difference to solving world hunger over the long run. And, and maybe the answer to that is, you know what, if we could make sure, if we could invent a new superfood in the next 10 years that um, had 10x the nutrition value of anything that's out there today, that would, that would be a game changer, even though world hunger won't be solved, but it will make such a major step forward in things that um, uh, we, you know, it, it, it would be a game changer and it's something we believe we could do in 10 years. In essence, for Education Superhighway, our ultimate goal was not just to put broadband in America's schools, right? Our ultimate goal was to improve education in America. But what we said was the single most leveraged thing we can do to make that happen is to make sure that students can access digital learning and that will be the, the cattle and, and the way we do that is to get broadband into every school. So we essentially did what I just said. Like the ultimate goal is not just to have broadband in every school. The ultimate goal is to make education 
fairer, more equitable, and more effective for, for every student in America. And our decision was that the most leveraged thing we could do was to fix the broadband problem to move that mission forward. Thank you. Everyone, thank you so much for joining. If any last questions pop up, feel free to type them in the chat. Otherwise, we would love to have you on our webinar next Friday, Government Partnerships, presented by our state engagement directors who worked with governor's offices and state departments of education across the country. And then our first webinar, Put Your Data to Work, is on demand. Thank you all so much for joining, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye now. Thanks, everyone.